Hi, welcome to Journeys with Jeff. It's Jeff Grandy, your host, and uh, good to have you tune, tune in for our show tonight. Our guest is uh, Dr. Bob Radin. Uh, Bob is a West Hartford native, Haw High graduate, um, went to Rensselaer, and has a PhD in theoretical physics from George Washington University. Uh, a, a longtime college professor, University of Maryland, Boston University, Wentworth, University of Hartford. He's uh, taught physics and calculus, and uh, he's re recently written a book that we're going to talk to him about. So we'll get right uh, to uh, right down to our guest here, uh, Bob. Good to see you. Good to see you. Tell me, uh, you were uh, let's go back. You were uh, you were a West Hartford boy. I was born in West Hartford. What was that? What was that like? What was it like? Well, which I, you know, childhood. Yeah, 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 sure. Well, no, it was a wonderful place to grow up. Um, you and I both knew about Trout Brook when it was a wild little little river. Uh, we we almost, one of our colleagues almost drowned in the darn thing. But <laughs> but uh, I remember some wonderful times as a child in, in West Hartford. And so let me. I, I just want to you know talk about this for a second. But oh, one thing I want to say. Um, I had a dysfunctional uh, experience with education in my early career. <laughs> what? What happened? Well, I, I, the, there was a little school called East School, and it was a beautiful brownstone building built in 1888. Um, Isn't it, that on Waiting Lane where the plant, the, plant yeah, junior high used to be? It, it, well, it was next to plant junior high. Right now there's a, there's okay, a senior yeah, citizen right, housing. Okay. okay. Um, but it was a wonderful, friendly old building. And it was a half a block from my house, so I'd walk there to go to first grade and second grade, first through fourth grade, I think it was there. Anyway, I think I'm in first grade, uh, and I walked up to school, and there was a little grassy area, and I saw a dog, I met a dog. Well, now I, one of my great themes of my life is that I love dogs, I still do. <laughs> I started playing with a dog till about three in the afternoon. <laughs> and then I walked into the school and into the classroom or whatever it was, I looked up at the teacher, I said, um, I was playing with a dog and she looked down at me, she just said, just matter of fact, yeah, I saw you. <laughs> so th there's two themes in my life right there. One is that I love dogs and, and the other that I really didn't care about school in the formal sense. So I like to quote Mark Twain, who said he never let school interfere with his education. And oh, what, the, what does that, but what does that teacher's response tell you about about her what if you could see her talk to her yeah. today what would you say to her I would say thank you for the tolerance and the lack of rebuke that you showed yeah yeah it was wonderful yeah wow that yeah. sounds like a, a special person to yeah to have um, I don't know but just mm -hmm. allowed that not yes, not come down on you true and she encouraged me not to study for for nine years <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> but I was out learning by myself. I was studying spiders, literally different kinds of spiders and how they wove their webs and how efficient they were at catching insects and all. So I, I was interested in nature, which is a, a theme of why, which got into the book, my book, Ecospasm. I love nature. I always yeah. have. But I finally, by the way, I did finally wake up in high school and I ended up going to Rensselaer and Engineering School. I eventually woke up, but I was kind of a late bloomer. Well, what were some of the, as a boy, go, going back to the, yeah. the, the spiders and, the, yeah. and playing with the dogs, what were a few, of the, uh, a few of the main things that you remember about growing up in West Hartford in the, in the 40s and the 50s? God, there's what so many. Some of the, there's so many. I have a list here. Um, the Central Theater was wonderful, especially on Saturday morning. We walked to the Central Theater. I don't know what it cost, 25 cents? You tell me. I can't remember. But there were like two features. There was a Western often. There was the Three Stooges, which were wonderful. Um, there were cartoons. And then, and then when that was, and there was about three hours of this stuff, as I remember. And then after that, on stage, they either had a yo-yo contest or a magic show. <laughs> Popcorn was 10 cents. Jujubees would pull your teeth out, the little candies, and so on. It was just a wonderful, happy time, a very happy time. Then there were, we, we built forts nearby, out in the woods and stuff like that. Um, I remember that Mount St. Joseph was a uh, Catholic girls' school. I thought, we all thought it was a place for the nuns because they wore these black habits, you know, they walked with their black dresses and they were kind of scary looking. But we went sledding there and, and the other thing, there were, they had a lot of land and it was wild. But I discovered some wild raspberry bushes one weekend and I went back home and told my father, my mother, and my brother 
And we went over there, we spent two hours picking raspberries, and we came back with 13 quarts of raspberries. My mother made uh, raspberry pie, which my brother called seed pie. <laughs> but yeah. the main thing about that is that was one of the happiest memories of my life because of the close, the family joy of being with the family, doing everything together. It cost nothing. It wasn't any kind of external entertainment. It was just a beautiful time. Um, ice skating at Elizabeth Park. Uh, um, uh -huh. Christmas memories, the man upstairs had a Christmas tree all decorated with all kinds of stuff. And by the way, I think Tinsel gets a bad name. I think Tinsel's beautiful on a Christmas tree. So many memories. Yeah. I, I, I could go on for an hour with those things. Well, okay. Well, yeah, I, I can remember a lot of the boyhood. Uh, some of the, We share some of the same sure. memories. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what, uh, you, 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 so you, you went on to Hall High. Yep. And there was, I understand that there was some uh, experiences uh, that you had in, in, with, with bullies and um, as you were y y young, you know, mm -hmm. the 90-pound the, uh, 90 pound, 90 pound weakling. Mm -hmm. But that, that kind of ended. When you got to Hall High, uh, things changed a little bit. Well, well I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about that. I mean, I, I was six months younger than everyone else in the class, and I was skinny. <laughs> And I got picked on it. I, I really got bullied for years. Um, it was eighth grade when I started to emerge, and I, I guess maybe because my physical strength increased, but I started getting into fights. Bully, kids would bully me, and I'd fight. That one continued into Hall High. I had a few fights in Hall High School. And it ended because what I discovered was the bully doesn't care about winning. The bully just cares that, that of, about intimidating you. And as soon as you stand up to them and show them you're not intimidated, they've lost their toy, and they don't care anymore. So the bullying ended for me in, in high school for that reason. Well, it, but you also got athletic. You got into athletics. You became a, yeah. a, 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 a track star. You did, <clears throat> excuse me. You were a, a miler. You did a, yeah. a five-minute mile. Yeah. yeah. And you were on the wrestling team. Yeah, all of that. So yeah. you became a... A little stronger and all of that and more, more athletic. Yeah. 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 And then, you, and then uh, you graduated from Hall. And uh, yeah, well, one, thing, one thing I quickly want to say about Hall, because I was on these yeah, wrestling team junior year and track team senior year, uh, and, and I, I don't want to take too much time with this, but on the way home, this was sort of classic of a lot of us. I, I'd walk home from Hall, and there was a Chicken Delight store, and I would eat a fried chicken on the way home. Then I'd come in, Mom, I'm not hungry. <laughs> and then I'd go out into the schoolyard, and we had these pickup games day after day after day after day, uh, and, which kept me in great shape, and then I'd come home, and I would be making at nighttime. I'd be when I was supposed to be studying. I'd be making balsa wood model airplanes and listening to the Red Sox, and I never did any homework. But what I did do at Hall High, I began to be very intellectually curious and ask a lot of questions, and that's how I got through. So. Well, and your 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 father, mm -hmm. fairly distinguished, pretty distinguished family. Your father was a was a, a medical doctor. Yeah, and uh, very well established in West Hartford, well known. Mm -hmm. I remember you told me about, uh, we we'll have to go into it, but I remember you told me how, just, just, just says, says a little bit about your father. There was a, yeah. a very cold winter night and there was a blizzard out. And your father got a phone call from a patient who lived in Windsor. Mm -hmm. And he drove from Hartford, West, from Hartford, from Farmington Avenue, oh. over to Windsor in the middle of a blizzard to, to you don't, you don't see that, you don't hear about that much around these days. No, you don't. Actually, it was an ice storm. It turns out it was an ice storm. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take, tell you quickly, but a, a patient, some, he didn't know this person. Some person called up at 3 in the morning, said his mother was deathly ill and no other doctor who would come out, would, you're my last hope, would you come out to Windsor? And he went, so he said he, he would try. He went to the garage and the garage door was all, all frozen with ice. He couldn't get in. So my mother had a copper kettle. She put water in it, put it on, on the stove. Boiled the water, he would take the copper kettle out and pour it on the, on the garage door. And finally, he got out there. And he got the car out, and, and he went out there. And probably was nitroglycerin, because he, when he came back, he told my mother she wouldn't have made it. The, the, that woman would not have made it to the night. So he probably gave her nitroglycerin or something like that in those days. But, but uh, you know, it was a terrible night, and ice storms and everything. But he went out and did it. He went he out, went and out did anyway. It. Mm -hmm. yeah. And your mother was a professional artist. Yeah. Uh, she did oils and she yeah. did. She sculpted. She sculpted. And yeah. then she studied. At, where did she study in Europe? Sorbonne. Well, she she went to Boston Museum School. She she, she was born in Worcester. She went one year to the to the Worcester Museum School, and then she went to the Boston Museum School of Fine Arts, and she studied under a rather eminent 
um, art teacher um, um, by the name of Philip Hale, who, who was a, the Hale family. But uh, for a couple of summers, it was in the 20s, and for a brief period, uh, her family was fairly well off for a brief period before the crash. Her father came over with penniless and, and did some real estate, you know, eventually. But anyway, she went for, they, they went on the ocean liners twice for two summers, and she stayed in a Sorbonne. She stayed in a, I'm sorry, pension near the Sorbonne, so you could walk around the corner and go into the Sorbonne and study the, the old masters, which she did. Wow. And it was really wonderful for and her. And you had uh, another member of the family, an older brother. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Harley. Harley, yeah. And uh, he, he was ahead of you, so he went, he went on to Rensselaer, yeah. and you kind of followed, did you go the, to Rensselaer just to kind of follow your big brother? Or yeah, pretty much. I, pretty I, didn't know, much? I had no idea what I wanted to do, so I went, I went there, yeah. yeah. And, and it was a tough place. Uh, uh, Rensselaer Polytech, that's up in Troy. Troy, New York. Yeah. Troy, New York. Mm -hmm. And you were studied... Uh, you got we you got your uh, B undergraduate degree. I studied physics by accident. <laughs> uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. I registered as undesignated, no major. And my brother said, "If you major in physics, you'll get better teachers the first semester and first year." So I did that, and then I, I realized I wanted to stay in physics. So yeah. So you majored in physics. Yeah. And what is it that what is it that uh, well you after well you graduated with your undergraduate degree then you moved to Washington to get a master's master's and PhD eventually. and a PhD yeah. uh, in theoretical physics yep mm -hmm. and uh, I'm not going to ask you to dilate on theoretical physics oh, because come on. for my sake come on I wouldn't know <laughs> but but ask me that, a question about special relativity go ahead that, that's so, yeah. just kidding is that got to do with aunts and uncles Don't and worry, brothers and yeah, sisters yeah that's what it has to special do with the crazy the crazy special relativity <laughs> relative in the attic go ahead yeah my 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 uh, <laughs> My uh, eccentric Uncle Edward, he was a yeah, special relative. That's it. Was, so at any rate, yes. you, you, uh, you, you went to, uh, got your PhD. Yeah. And w w what's the first uh, theoretical physics? What do, you, what, do you, what do you do? What did you do with that after you graduated? Well, after, well, actually, I, while I was in graduate school, I was working mostly full time in some research, government research laboratories, including National Cancer. I had sort of like a postdoctorate right after, after I got the PhD fellowship at the National Cancer Institute, where I learned a fair amount of biology, and uh, I'll come back to that maybe with talking about the book. Um, but I really wanted to teach. That's what my dream was. Um, that's what I thought I was best at and what I loved to do. So I began to teach. I, I graduated into a, with my PhD into a recession. I didn't know it at the time. It's just that you couldn't find a teaching job. For every, for every job that was um, you know, uh, advertised, there were like 200 applicants. Anyway, so I started my teaching job at community colleges and then went to Boston University from there. And what, what is it that attracted you to be, to get into education yeah. as opposed to working in the private sector with some corporation or some, doing some research or whatever? Mm. Why did you decide to get into education? You mean into teaching? Uh, teaching, yeah, yeah. Two quick things. Uh, one is, at my senior year, I, w I was taking a fairly difficult course on electromagnetic theory. And the professor gave us something to take home and study, and it was combining electromagnetic theory with Einstein's theory of relativity and kind of a mathematical formulation of it. And he gave it to all of us. So I, my roommates didn't bother to read it. I read it, I studied it, and then I explained it to some of my, my roommates and my other classmates. And I found out two things. Number one, I was pretty good at doing that. They understood it. And number two, I loved doing it. So that was number one. Number two, lifestyle. Um, it was, uh, again, my senior year, I was in a the physics laboratory building, with cinder block walls. I'm sitting on the floor doing a, a physics lab. It's about 3 o'clock in the afternoon or 3.30 on a Friday afternoon. And down the hall is, is one of the physics professors coming down the hall. And he takes a left and goes in and he starts BSing with another professor for a while. Comes out, comes down the hall toward me some more, takes a right, starts BSing with another professor, comes out, looks at his watch. He says, oh, 5.15, time to go home. I said, this is for me. <laughs> Oh, wow. The freedom, the freedom, the lifestyle freedom. Well, okay. Not the money, but and, the and you, and, well, and you wound up doing that, as I told the audience. You right. studied, you taught at many various institutions, colleges, universities. Yep. And um, I know you wrote a, um, a college-level calculus textbook mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so on. So you did that. Now you, you're 
kind of, you've done that for years and years. I, I want to just get you on to the topic sure. that's on first and foremost in my mind. Sure. Because of the, I think everybody is becoming more and more conscious of environmental problems mm -hmm. these days. And I know that you had an idea for a, a science fiction novel based on science research. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did that, um, what were the, what were, the, the book is called Ecospasm. Yeah. We have a copy of it right there. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are some of the three main themes that, it, that, it, that Ecospasm explores? Okay, so first, uh, not in any particular, first I suppose in first order is the first two, let's say. One is that we are intimately connected with our environment. We're interdependent on it. I, I like to quote Shelf, Chief Seattle, it's named, you know, Seattle, Washington was named after Native American. The Native Americans very tuned into their, into nature. And Chief, Chief Self said, um, uh, what befalls the earth befalls the sons and daughters of the earth. Man did not weave the web of life. He is but a strand in it. What, we, what he does to the web, he, he does to himself. So that's one thing that captures it. The second theme is, the, is, is very important, I think, and that's the the um, law of unintended consequences. And for that, I, I quote Professor Stoller from University of Vermont, and, and that says that, um, um, let's see, I don't remember it. <laughs> uh, consequences of human actions offer, offer differ, often differ sharply from the motivations of those who acted. So the consequences of human actions mm -hmm. often differ sharply from the motivations of those who acted. And that's, that's an important theme because uh, in, in ecospasm, we talk about genetic engineering for the, for the best of, of intentions, going off the rails and corrupting the food supply and invading the human genome. That's part of the story. Well, just generally, Bob, your, your main focus mm -hmm. on, as you researched and wrote this book, yeah. was not, uh, I mean, a lot of the talk these days is global warming, and that's a, right. something for another show and another, yeah. but you focus more on, uh, uh, genetic engineering and GMOs and mm -hmm. pesticides mm -hmm. and uh, that the unintended consequences of how that that kind of um, appli those applications have a adverse effect on the environment on, on what plant life and uh, right well the whole e ecosystem right so uh, as I mentioned to you many times uh, I came up with an idea decades ago, literally, and it was a simple question I asked myself. What would happen if plants stopped producing sugar and nutrients? And the, an the answer was obvious to me at the time. All animals would die because animals can't create their own food. Pl so that's why we're so independent. Plants use photosynthesis. So they take a carbon dioxide in the air and water vapor. They use the sun's energy. They ram those molecules together and they produce sugar and they give off oxygens. Animals eat the sugar which goes in, which we use for, for, for life and, and our, our nutrition. And then we give off oxygen, we give off carbon dioxide, which goes back to the plants. It's a perfect symbiosis. And, and we really can't live without each other. Um, so that, that's... And the, 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 what you just ex explained to me, this is not your opinion. This is, no, no. This is scientific fact. Right. The other, the other piece of scientific fact, I, so I, I put that story away. I didn't know where it was going decades ago. I put it away for decades, came back to it. Um, and, and I was walking by, uh, looking at a newspaper outside, and it was about, um, it was about uh, master control genes. And I looked at, and a bingo, I knew that was gonna be it. So master control genes is not something I made up, it, it's, it's current research, and that, that caused, that, and I won't go into it, but that, that forms the basis of the, of the scientific base of the story. And then of course I go beyond that into science fiction because this story, is supposed to take place in 85 years from now. So technology is going to be advanced in ways we can't imagine. So anyway. Oh, if, if just, just to, so I won't, won't forget it, we're going to, again, the minutes are, I know. are, are, are winding down I, I know pretty fast. Are. But uh, just to, to, to make sure we, that we mention it, there may be some viewers out there who would like more information um, to, 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 to do you have a website or is there some way that yeah. if a viewer is interested in some of your research or some of your the science that you're talking about or uh, your, your, your book, what, what, can they, what can they do? Well, I do have a website and it's um, 
my name, robertradin.com, R-O-B-E-R-T-R-A-D-I-N, one word, dot com, okay? There's some information there. There's actually more information on Amazon. The book is available on Amazon, and what Amazon does is it allows you to read a few free chapters. So there's probably better as far as just information about the flavor of it to go to Amazon as opposed to my website. My website is a work in progress at this point. I see. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me uh, just uh, uh, b backtrack just a little bit. You were, you were uh, because most of your professional career was devoted to being an educator. You were mm -hmm. a teacher. Right. And you taught college level, mostly undergraduates and some graduate students. Mm -hmm. What, what uh, beside the, the content, you taught math, you taught physics, yep. what, what, what did you find the most rewarding aspect of being a, an educator for all those years? Mm -hmm. What was some of the greatest rewards and satisfaction that you got It's pretty that. simple. I, I, I found a niche for myself, which is students that had trouble learning math and physics, or they had a self-image, I can't do math, I can't do physics. And it was, my, my passion was to show them that, to change their self-image from one of success, from failure to one of success, by A, helping them learn the math and physics, which I was pretty good at, but also, more important for me than passing on some knowledge, was that they have experiences of a success in doing math and physics and, you know, with exams and learning, et cetera, and change their self-image from failure to success. That's probably the most important thing in terms of, a, of an educator for me. And also, once in a blue moon, you would actually, when someone was, a student was struggling with something, they suddenly got it. It was almost like a light went off. You could see that. That was, that was well, a joy. How do, you, how do you create, and this goes for, from preschool teachers mm -hmm. all the way up to the highest level, the PhD level, mm -hmm. college, high school, yeah. elementary school. Yeah. How does a, an educator get, get kids, students, to take responsibility, to be motivated, to, to, to believe mm -hmm. in themselves? Mm -hmm. I'm sure everybody would agree that that's the, yeah. you know, that was one of your overriding goals is to yeah. empower these kids with a sense of, of uh, I can do it. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm smart enough, I'm good enough. How do you, how do, you do that? Do well, you lecture them about it or do you? No, I can only talk personally. First, you really got to care about them and mean it. And they can tell, can't they? They can tell, but not only, and really mean it. And then you got to put the energy into how can I explain this in a in a way that's simple that they can really get. And if they really get it, and and they know you care about them, they will work for you. That's what I found out. And some of the students wrote to me. They said, "I don't want to let Professor Raiden down. I'm going to do this work." But they knew I cared about them, and then therefore they cared more about themselves. And they also knew that they could do it because they, had, I, they I was able to successfully help them learn the stuff. And that led to that's what you, I think I told you once. Uh, one of my favorite um, quote things that I like to recount to people is mm. that in the 1960s, yeah. Martin Luther King mm -hmm. was at an educational conference, uh -huh. mm -hmm. and um, the, the the auditorium was full of educators and administrators. Yeah. And there was a big banner across the stage. Um, first, teach them to read. Mm -hmm. And Martin Luther King turned to the person next to him and pointed to the banner yeah. and said, "It should be first teach them to believe in themselves." Wow. Yeah. What, what, what's your reaction to that? I think he was right on. I think he nailed it. <laughs> but and you apply that. It sounds to me, I, from what you're saying, you you did that, whether it was. Consciously Look, or unconsciously, no, it was you, conscious. Just, you did it. Look, to, there's one thing I quickly, I probably use five seconds to say this, but I know there is something called a self-image. And, and your subconscious takes you to the, you, you set a goal with your conscious mind, your subconscious gets you there. You can't, you can't achieve a goal that's inconsistent with your self-image. Your life won't do it. So until you raise a self-image towards success, no matter how hard you try, you're going to fail. If you have a self-image of failure, you can strategize all you want. And, and you'll fail. Some people sabotage themselves, for instance. They feel, I'm not worth it, so they sabotage it. Whatever the reason is, with, you can't do something inconsistent with your self-image. So first and foremost, you've got to raise a self-image to one of success. And you do that by giving them experiences where they actually succeed. It sounds like what you're saying is you can change a person's self-image or their behavior or their thinking by 
doing something to alter the, by altering the environment that they're in. So would you say that that the environment is a crucial factor in the development of a human being? Well, uh, of course. I would say yes. Like the right? <laughs> yes, for better or for worse. Yeah, for better or for worse. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Well, listen, we're gonna, we got a couple of minutes left. I just oh, want to really? ask you. Okay. Uh, what uh, you've you've had certainly no shortage of accomplishments in in your life. Yeah. From the college degrees to you've written books. You've mm -hmm. uh, you know, the list go is a long list. What is it that as you look back, Bob? Mm -hmm. What is it that you're uh, most the proudest of what accomplishment? What was your greatest accomplishment? Well, I would, I, would, I would reframe the question, what's the most important thing to me? Um, not necessarily an accomplishment. Um, when I was a kid, I learned, and I won't go into it, that I cared about people. I just When I was four years old, it, I saw that. That's really important to me. I think it's important for all of us to care genuinely. Um, the accomplishment is helping the students you know, overcome their negative self-image and succeed. And another thing was taking care of my mother when she was elderly, and, uh, and, and not as a burden, but as an act of love. And that was probably the most valuable thing I've ever done in my life. I have no regrets about it whatsoever. Wow, mm. wow. Very, very interesting. Mm. And, and uh, is, there, is there a, can you think of a, can you think of a, of a book that, 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 you've, that you read? I mean, you, I know you've read <laughs> thousands of them. Mm. Is there a book that kind of, that you read that stands out Sure. Well, there are three, but one by, and it's interesting because it, it relates to back into the study of the ecospasm, which is the light and the dark side of technology, or the shadow side. That's true with human beings. It's true of nature. So Bernie Siegel, who is one of my, uh, I really idol almost, I look up to him as a, as, a, as a medical doctor, contemporary, wrote two books. One was called um, Le, um, Medicine, uh, something Medicine and Miracles, and, and, and the other was uh, Peace, Love, and Healing. And so those were the joyful light side, enlightened side of, of human life. The other book uh, uh, that is on the other end, this, the dark side, and it's a book called The Sociopath Next Door. And, that, and that's another reality of human life. So the two extremes were Bernie yeah. Siegel at the light, enlightened end, and now she has wrote an enlightened book about our dark side. Well, Bob, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. And I think that uh, yeah. the, 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 all the viewers, there's certainly so many things that we touched on, touched on yeah. uh, today yeah. that there's something that can be uh, you know gleaned by every viewer out there that that uh, um, that that we touched on that that's can be they can find meaningful and uh, interesting and again i want to thank you very much for joining us today being a guest sharing your journey mm -hmm. and uh, i want to thank the viewers out there for paying a, a uh, you know, paying us a visit and um, watching the program, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you very much. Jeff Grandy, signing off. Take care.